reform in Yale houses. And today we have with us Professor Tom Tyler of Yale Law to talk about legitimacy and policing. <coughs> Professor Tom Tyler's research examines the role of judgments about the justice or injustice of group procedures in shape of legitimacy, compliance, and cooperation. He was recently honored by the International Society for Justice Research with his 2012 Lifetime Achievement Award. He's also a past recipient of the Calvin Prize for Paradigm Shifting Fellowship in the Study of Law and Society. <laughs> Well, as I was telling Lawrence, I heard by phone that it snowed this morning in New Haven. So I'm especially appreciative that you invited me out here to speak to you, and I'm having a great time. I know that this is under the auspices of the Law and Society program, and I wanted to just say that I think there are many things that social science can contribute to law, two things that in particular have been important are social science inputs into legal doctrine, which is something that I will not talk about today. But the second is help from social science in designing legal institutions, which is more in terms of local communities, local authorities, the police and the courts that people actually deal with and the way those institutions operate. That has been my primary concern over the years, and it's definitely what I'm going to talk to you about today. What I'm going to talk about is an area that I think is, at this moment in American history, a very interesting area for us because there's enormous change occurring, and that is the policies and practices of the police. But at the same time, similar changes are occurring all over the United States in the policies and practices of the courts. And I'll try to draw that parallel as I go along. Think about the general question of how we might evaluate policies and practices of the police. If we think about the last 25, 30 years, there are two things that have been important. The first is lawfulness. When we think about the actions that the police undertake. Ever since the Warren Court, there's been an emphasis on discussing what's a legally appropriate thing for a police officer to do. Used to be many discussions, when is it appropriate for a police officer to stop someone on the street and question them? When is it appropriate to pull out your gun? When is it appropriate to shoot someone? Today we have when is racial profiling, if it's occurring, appropriate? When are aggressive police stops on the streets appropriate? And I thought it was interesting that just this morning, Mayor Bloomberg defended the fact that the uh, NYPD had been sending informants into raft trips taken by Muslim students. How did he defend this policy? It's legal. So one way that you can think about the question that you would ask about anything the police do is, is it legal? Now that would be typical in a law school. And when you go to law school conferences, that is what lawyers talk about, Terry stops, things like that. Is this appropriate? Is this appropriate? Is this appropriate? You go over to the police department, what the police have tended to talk about for the last 25 or 30 years is effectiveness. There's a big emphasis in policing on evidence-based police policies, developing approaches to trying to combat crime, what works in efforts to suppress crime. So when Ray Kelly is asked about the 600,000 street stops that occurred last year of adolescents in New York City, he says, we saved 9,000 lives because we got guns off the street. So the effectiveness argument is, is an argument about what makes a policy or practice a good policy or practice. We've seen a lot of that. Comstat is one of the most famous examples. Hotspots policing is another example. The idea is that the police evaluate what they do by whether they believe that it effectively suppresses crime and in the other case that has become important because of 911 service calls, 
whether they respond rapidly or effectively when people call them and ask for services. This is an approach, um, Sarah and I were talking earlier about law and economics. This is an approach that I think is perfect for an instrumental era, which is the era we've all been living through, where you say that what people really care about is their outcomes, and if the outcomes are good, then the authorities are doing their job. But what I would like to do is to frame those goals against a paradox that I think has become clear when we think about policing in America. And that is, although most people acknowledge that on these criteria, lawfulness and effectiveness, the police have gotten better in the last 20 or 30 years, and even the National Academy of Sciences in their report on policing said they've gotten better. Public support for the police has not risen in any kind of appreciable way over that 30-year period. I'm going to refer to public support for the police as police legitimacy. And I'll argue both that it hasn't increased and that particularly important to us, it hasn't increased among minority communities. Now, just so you understand what I'm talking about when I talk about legitimacy, it's the idea that people feel that the police are entitled to exercise authority in their community. They're entitled to manage social order. They're entitled to make decisions about enforcing the rules that people ought to obey. When we look at it empirically, there are three things that people typically measure. Trust and confidence in the police. Police officers are honest. They do what's good for the people in the community. Willingness to defer. If a police officer makes a decision, I ought to obey it. I should follow orders from police officers. And then that the things that the police do are morally appropriate. In the public opinion literature that you may read in newspapers, that's usually all of this is referred to as trust and confidence in the police. So what about trust and confidence in the police? These are national data in the United States over the last 30 years. And what you can see is that more or less, this line is flat. Depending on how you might choose to do the analysis, you could argue that there's a minuscule positive slope, but it's certainly not very striking. It sticks between 50 and 60% for most of the last 30 years, and it's very flat. The other thing that's noticeable, often commented on because it's actually very striking in the public opinion literature, is the enormous racial gap in trust and confidence in the police. You can see that it's about 20%. African Americans are about 20% less likely to have confidence in the police. That was true in 2000. It's true in 2011. We could go back further, but these are good data. So see that basically the gap isn't closing. So neither among the general public nor among minorities are we seeing any evidence that these changes in policing in America are impacting on the view that the public has about the police, and in particular, the crucial issue of police legitimacy. Well, why should we care? There are three things that are clear from recent empirical research about legitimacy. The first is that when the police are viewed as legitimate, when they deal with people in the public, they encounter less resistance, less hostility. There's less likelihood of what we call pushback, or in other words, fighting with the police. It can lead to violence. It can hurt the officers and the public. Voluntary decision acceptance is increased. And particularly important for us, adherence over time. So if you are a police officer and you go stop someone from playing their stereo on 2 a.m. on Saturday night and then you get in your car and drive off and at 2.15 you get a call that they turned it back on, you're not having an experience that's very unusual, but obviously the ability of the police to do their jobs is diminished. So we want adherence over time and we're more likely to get that if the police are legitimate. We also want generally voluntary compliance with the law, and even cooperation 
with legal authorities in the community, and those are all increased by legitimacy. So if the police are not viewed as legitimate, we don't get those things. We don't achieve those gains. As a psychologist, people often say to me that I think that every problem needs a psychological analysis. And I probably do, but in this case, I think I'm going to try to convince you that you should think that we need a psychological analysis as much as I do. We need to ask, what is it that makes the police legitimate? If it's not the objective lawfulness of police behavior or the effectiveness of the police in controlling crime, why are the police viewed as legitimate? And in particular, how can we influence police legitimacy in the community? What I'll argue is that what we need to do is we need to reframe the way we think about policies and practices. We need to think about how policies and practices impact on police legitimacy in the community, particularly the minority community. As you can see what I'm going to argue for. It's a new approach to looking at the things that the police are doing. Drawing upon the psychological literature on legitimacy, what I'm going to try to show is that an approach like that will actually be effective, that it will work. I'm going to try to show that to you through empirical research, that we can imagine a strategy of identifying the antecedents of police legitimacy and building policies and practices through that knowledge about how legitimacy is created. Now, I said legitimacy is obligation, responsibility, trust, and confidence. I won't go more into that. But I'll make two arguments. The first argument you've heard me make, legitimacy matters. But I'm going to argue that it's more important than the risk of sanctioning, that actually legitimacy is a better basis for the relationship between the police and the public than the ability of the police to threaten to punish the public, and that it has the benefit of increasing voluntary actions on behalf of the police and the law, which fear of punishment does not do. Now, the second argument, which is the crucial one from my point of view, is that legitimacy is rooted in procedural justice. That is, we ask the question, why are the police legitimate? It's because of the fairness of the way that they exercise their authority. Not effectiveness, not lawfulness, but perceived procedural justice is the root of legitimacy. That includes neutral decision making and respect for people and their rights. And we can ask three different kinds of questions when we do research. We could just ask people how fair are procedures for decision making, how fairly are people treated, or we can get into what they mean by that, fair decision making, neutral, rule-based, consistent, unbiased treatment, treat them with respect, courtesy, dignity, respect for people, respect for their rights. All of these elements basically are one big glob in people's minds. And so we can ask this question any way we want to, but people clearly do distinguish decision making and interpersonal treatment. And we always find that both of those matter. Now, can I convince you empirically that these arguments are right? Legitimacy drives desirable behavior. Procedural justice drives legitimacy. The kind of research that I do involves interviews with the public. People talk about their views about the law, about the police. What do the police do? How do they act? Are they fair? Are they efficient? And then we gather information about people's law-related behavior. We have self-report, report from family, friends, and police records are all ways to find out what people are doing if they're breaking the law. So we connect people's judgments to their behavior. Well, first, let's just look at everyday obedience of the law. Jeff Fagan and I did a study of New Yorkers. I like to think this is an especially tough test if people in New York City care about legitimacy. This surely speaks to the whole country. We asked people about the legitimacy of the police, their performance, 
either in terms of they can fight crime, they can catch lawbreakers, and then compliance in everyday life as self-reported and then self-reported cooperation. And here's the key point. This is a regression analysis. So these are the relative influences of these different factors on compliance and cooperation. Compliance, to some degree, occurs because of the risk of punishment, to some degree, the effectiveness of the police. But the primary reason people comply is that they think the police are entitled to their obedience. The real payoff with legitimacy comes voluntary cooperation. Now that involves, if there were a criminal in your community, would you report that criminal to police? If there were a crime occurring, would you report it? Cooperation in the sense of fighting crime, and then also, would you work with the police on neighborhood watch? Would you go to a community meeting to work with the police about problems in your community? Two forms of cooperation. They're both related primarily to legitimacy. There kind of is a two-part argument here. You can run the system based upon objective indicators, but you can run it better based upon legitimacy if you just want people to follow the law. But if you want this more voluntary kind of relationship between the police and the community, you really have to focus on legitimacy. Now, it's, there's a lot of research in this area. These are typical findings. I won't go through all of the research just to say that I'm happy to send you 10 or 15 papers if you'd like to get them that makes this the same point. Jeff and I also did a panel study where we validated this basic argument. People are interviewed at several points in time. And the complicated regression equation really just says exactly the same thing. But if you control on prior factors, you see that cooperation comes out of legitimacy for more than anything else, more than risk, our ability to, to suppress crime. And just to give you a hint of the future, there's no ethnicity difference. All of the different ethnic groups that we were interviewed had exactly the same reaction. They helped the police that they thought that they were legitimate. Because of the concern about self-report, we did a study with Larry Sherman. The primary reason for this study is that we could get police records. And so we looked at the relationship of legitimacy of legal authorities among people who had gone through an adjudication of their case because they had been arrested for driving while they were drunk. And then police records of their future law-breaking behavior in the years three and four, that is, starting two years after their case for two years after that. And what you can see is that people who ended up thinking that the police were not legitimate after they went through this court procedure, police court procedure, were five times more likely to recidivate, to break the law again in those two business of period into the future. So even if you just look at police records, you see legitimacy affects behavior. So that's my argument first. Legitimacy affects behavior. But of course, we would care about that more if we had a good argument for how to make the police legitimate. And so that's the second argument, that people are very ethics-oriented in their judgment about legal authorities. This is also true of court officials, but I'll talk about the police. When people deal with the police or the courts, they are focused on whether or not those authorities are exercising their authority in fair ways. Again, just to give you a sense of this, why are the police legitimate in the sense of obligation? Why are they legitimate in the sense of trust and confidence? It's really not that the police are effective in fighting crime or that they can catch people who break the rules. If the police in your community exercise their authority fairly through fair procedures, you think they're legitimate. There's some interesting new research by John Jackson. This is a general study of the English, why it is that people in England obey the law. 
his contribution has been to develop a little bit more diverse concept of legitimacy it's in what I have been concerned about obligation, but also he adds the second component of moral alignment. He feels that in England, people care a lot about whether they think the police share the values, goals, and purpose of the community. So what about that? It's a national sample of English focused on compliance. This is the result, and hopefully this is visible. Perceived risk of sanction, nothing. Legitimacy of the law, less likely to break it. And also moral alignment, less likely to break the law. And then, just to give you a vision of the future, why obligation, why moral alignment? Because the police are exercising their authority fairly. So procedural justice, legitimacy, compliance. Then just by lucky coincidence, John Jackson did a study of the young minority males who were rioting in London before they rioted, and to understand why they cooperate with the police, and found that obligation to obey the police, moral alignment, again, were very strong predictors of cooperation. And again, procedural fairness was a very strong predictor of both obligation and moral alignment. Excuse me, just a second while I put this back on. Okay. All right. So this was before the London riots, but it makes the, the key point that procedural justice leads to legitimacy, leads to compliance and cooperation. All right. General model of authority, perfect for us. Legitimacy shapes cooperation. Procedural justice shapes legitimacy. Let me talk a little bit more about this procedural justice element. It ought to be the case that fair procedures should le legitimize acceptance of police decisions in specific encounters with the public. Yen Huo and I studied this question. We studied it using people's reactions to personal experiences with the police. And we were concerned about what legitimizes decisions in the sense that people willingly accept them. I did what the police officer asked. I wasn't angry. I didn't try to fight back. I didn't try to appeal. I'll go along with this. I'll do it in the future. OK, so you accept it. Large study of Oakland and Los Angeles. Reason Oakland and Los Angeles are multicultural. They have histories of bad relationships between the police and the community. And the question is, why do people accept the decisions of police officers? We asked all kinds of decision elements, outcomes were good, procedural was fair, and then I complied and I more willingly deferred. Here's what's interesting. Why would people willingly defer? Overall, procedural justice is dominant. People defer because they think that the authorities acted fairly. Outcomes don't really have much to do with it. And especially important, that's true for all of the different groups that were studied, in particular minority groups. So minority groups are not really any different than whites. They defer when they think the police are exercising their authority fairly. Now here's, just to give you a sense for why this is really important, here's how much it matters. We divide people up in two dimensions. I got a good ad outcome, I got a bad outcome. So I got a ticket, I didn't get a ticket. The police treated me fairly, they treated me unfairly. I was willing to accept the decision. So one way you can get people to defer to your authority is you can give them a better outcome. And if you do, you get about 10% more deference. But if you treat them fairly, you get about 70% more deference. And furthermore, even if you're giving people a bad outcome, you get much more deference if you treat them fairly. So you deliver a bad outcome, but through a fair procedure. People are reacting very strongly to fairness. 
not the outcome. Now, the other aspect of policing that's come up a lot lately among the police is service delivery, because the police have pegged themselves to 911 calls, and now that they don't have as much money, that's getting to be a problem. But it's the same thing. Satisfaction with service calls is not really about the outcome. How quickly did the police arrive? Okay, did they solve my problem or not solve my problem? It's really about whether they treated you fairly. And even if that you don't solve someone's problem, they're about 60% more likely to accept and be satisfied with the way you handle things if you treat them fairly. So whether it's a question of delivering regulatory outcomes or delivering service, it's the same argument. Procedural justice drives acceptance of police authority. I won't talk about the courts, but this study also looked at people's relationships to the courts. The results are identical. So if you go to court and you deal with a judge, it's exactly the same thing. And it doesn't matter there if you're a plaintiff or a defendant, it's exactly the same thing. So we're understanding the important role of procedural justice, both in general, but also in specific, when you're personally dealing with an authority. And just to illustrate the point I'm trying to make about the acceptance of authority, if we compare compliance to deference, you can see with compliance, it's really a little bit about procedural justice, but eh, I mean, well, the way people put it to me is when there's a police officer standing there with a gun and a mace and a club and whatever else they happen to be carrying that day, you're going to do what they tell you to do. And it really doesn't make any difference whether they're being fair or not. But if we're talking about willing acceptance of police authority, then it's really important whether or not the police treat you fairly. So it's really about acceptance, gaining acceptance from people that leads to deferring over time, viewing the police as legitimate, cooperating with the police, as opposed to just doing what you're told, which has no implications in this broader sense. The other thing that generalization from personal experience to general views about legitimacy is driven by procedural justice leads me to make an argument that I should make but people often find hard to believe. Fortunately, here I am in Stanford, we probably all have cars, so you're driving home on the freeway tonight, you get stopped by the California Highway Patrol, you get a ticket. So as you're walking, as the officer is walking back to his car and you're getting in with your ticket, can you imagine that you'd think, you know, I have more respect for the police than I used to. I really think the police are legitimate, I really ought to cooperate with them. Hard to believe. Okay, well, so, but it's true. This is a study of New Yorkers, pre and post, having an experience with the police where they got a negative outcome, but they got it through a fair procedure. What happens? Legitimacy of the police goes up. Willingness to cooperate with the police to fight crime in your community goes up. So it's not that you can't regulate people without destroying support. You can regulate people and still have their support if you do it through fair procedures. I recently gave a talk to the judges of Belgium, and I was supposed to speak about their national judicial survey. So I got there and I discovered they had a 50% approval rate. And I thought, well, that doesn't sound great to me. But the judges were ecstatic because their view is every case you have a winner and a loser. So if somebody hates you, somebody loves you. So 50%, basically, like everybody who won loved you. That's pretty much, that's maxing out, right? That's what you can do. That's what you would think if you had an outcome-based perspective. But my argument is with a process-based perspective, you don't think about it that way at all. In fact, you can deliver negative outcomes and increase legitimacy and cooperation as long as you do it through a fair procedure. All right, just to give one other example of this, it's a study done in Queensland. I, I love this study because in Australia, drinking is a big issue, and so they have random roadblocks to check people for being drunk. 
And they, the baseline was not much procedural justice. But they trained officers to randomly do a procedural justice script where they basically treated people fairly. So it's an imposed stop, but it, suddenly you're getting fairness as opposed to the control group, which is what you usually get, which was not much fairness. And so this is like a couple of minutes. He gets stopped, you blow into the tube, and most of the time you just leave. But whether you leave or not, then you get interviewed about your experience. In the procedural justice condition, the police did simple things. They said, they explained why we're stopping you, what the purpose of our policy is. Here's a newsletter about what the police are doing in your community. We would love your feedback about what you think the police policy should be. Here's the commissioner's phone number. Here's his email. Send him a note. He wants to hear from you. So they explained the purpose of the policy. They said, we don't like to have to go to people's homes and tell them that someone has died because of a drunk driving accident. We have this policy in place to try to protect people in the community from those deaths. And then finally, they were told, say something respectful to the person. You know, anything, anything you can think of, like thanks for having a clean car, or thanks for having your seatbelt on, or thanks for not yelling at me. But end the conversation on a respectful, positive note towards the person. All right, so just a couple minutes. And what they found is, this is the experimental condition. If people were treated fairly, they were significantly more likely to view the police as fair in that instance, which led them to think that the police were more fair in general, which led them to think the police were more legitimate, which led them to cooperate more with the police. So in other words, two to five minutes, you've got a significant effect from that two to five minutes all the way to the willingness of the person to cooperate with the police to fight crime in their community. So even small variations in fairness can have a big impact on public views and public behavior. All right. So we can use fair procedures to get these desirable gains. Now what is a fair procedure? Just to look at the uh, California data, I mentioned that people could usually distinguish decision making and quality of treatment. This is a very typical finding. Both of them matter, but quality of treatment is particularly important. We find that even though people do care about neutral decision making, even though they do react to it and they do sense if they think they're getting neutral decision making or not, they're especially concerned about how they're treated as people. They're treated with respect and dignity. Their rights are respected. They think the authorities care about them, are trying to think about their situation. They feel that they're listened to, that what they say is considered. That always emerges as more important, or let's say usually more important. But both things matter. All right. So we can do something better. We can build a better model for the exercise of legal authority by building legitimacy. We don't have to rely on sanctions. And I would say that in the dealings that I've had with police commanders, police commanders would acknowledge all of the problems that I would point to. But they would also say there is no alternative. How can you police? How can you regulate? You have to threaten people. And my argument is the research does not support that perspective. There are better ways to exercise legal authority than by sanction. And I hope this research is compelling that that is true. All right. The other thing that everyone says now is we don't have any money. When I get invited to talk to police departments, they always say, we'd love to hear your ideas for change, but we don't have any money. So what can you do when you don't have any money? This is sort of something we all think about every day nowadays. What can you do when you don't have money? This isn't costly. This is something that you can do just by training. That is, this you don't have to buy a new tank, you know, or you don't have to buy some new infrared sensor or something like that, or 10,000 bulletproof vests. You just have to train people to do this. You just have to change the training procedures. So this is something you can do now. 
The other thing that I think is really important is that this bridges across gaps that have been central to a lot of discussions in law and society and a lot of discussions in our culture. This is something that everybody wants and everybody reacts to. It's not white versus minority. Everyone reacts to their experiences in the same way. And finally, can we extend this to agents of social control? There's an irony in everything that I'm saying, which is the police in America are a quasi-military organization and actually have gotten a lot worse since 911. So how can you tell a police officer, you know, you go to your station house, nobody tells you anything, nobody listens to you, they treat you really badly, but when you get out on the street, you should really be nice to people, treat them fairly, listen to them, think about their point of view, treat them respectfully. You're asking someone to do things that don't happen to them. And my argument would be that that's not realistic, that people are going to communicate out on the street the experience that they have in the station house. So we need to change the way the station house is organized. And this echoes comments that were made by the National Academy of Sciences that in fact, we need to find ways to allow the police to exercise greater discretion out on the streets if we want them to be effective. Now the problem is, you don't want people exercising discretion if they're going to use their discretion to drag people into an alley and beat them up. In other words, you have to have some confidence that these people you're giving discretion to are actually going to use it in a way that you'll be okay about. So what do we know about why officers actually follow organizational policies? So if you have a policy that you don't break the law, do people out on the street, officers actually follow it? And then furthermore, do they actually do things to help their organization? So there's a study of, uh, it's a combined study of police officers and soldiers, but I'll just give a general sense of what the findings are. The police can think that their own organization is legitimate, just the way the public thinks the police are legitimate. In particular, superiors, the police organization, how does that legitimacy compare to whether the police officers think that they either would gain or lose by following rules? So if you want to get promoted, follow the rules. If you don't, you'll get your pay docked or sanctioned or some way. So same finding that the key issue for officers out on the street, and actually for soldiers out in the field, is do they view their superiors and their organization as legitimate? Why would they do that? Well, again, we'd like to think it's because of procedural justice, and we'd be right. Why do you think that your superiors are legitimate? Because they make decisions, they treat people in fair ways. So the police officers in the station house are not any different than the people out on the street. And the argument is if you democratize the station house and create a procedural justice climate, you're going to create one out on the street also. This is related to one of the big issues right now in police departments all over America. That issue is um, a whole generation of old white guys is retiring. The police are struggling not all departments, but many departments are struggling to try to diversify their police force. Why would they be able to diversify? Why would minority officers stay in the organization? So the study of Baltimore County and their police department, like most police departments, it's got a little bit of diversity and they'd like to keep it. So how can you keep it? If Minorities and women think that the department acts fairly, they're more likely to say that they'll stay. They're more likely to be committed to their job. And then to me, the key point, you don't actually have to choose between a policy that's pro-diversity and a policy that's generally good because actually everyone feels the same way about it. What would white officers, white male officers like to have? Procedural justice. What would minorities like to have? What would women like to have? They'd all like to have procedural justice. So you don't have to pick 
one policy, depending on which group you're interested in, you can have one policy. All right. And then just finally, I've also recently been doing research on Muslim Americans, ironically. I mean, so now suddenly that's in the news, so great. I have something to say about it. We want to gain cooperation for our minority communities if we are going to address threats of terrorism. The RAND Corporation says, what do you need to effectively address problems of terrorism? You need community cooperation from the minority community. How do we get it? This is a study of Muslims in London. Same kind of cooperation that we talked about before. I would report a threat. Someone was building a bomb in the apartment next door, I would call the police. If I were asked to help police my community, I would do it. One of these complicated regression equations, but the main point is, why would you do that? The police are legitimate. They use fair procedures. It's got nothing to do with anything you think about terrorism. It's got nothing to do with anything about religion or identification with the Muslim community. It's all about whether you think the police are legitimate, they exercise their authority in fair ways. So if you want cooperation from minority communities like the Muslim community, you need to focus on how that community experiences the policing that's occurring. We replicated this in New York City. It's the same result, so I won't show it. But the point is, this also speaks to anti-terror efforts, and it shows why just about everything that the NYPD has done in the last 10 years is just insane. I think somebody said that today, that they're insane. They're out of control. They just, it's completely the wrong policy. It's really alienating the community whose cooperation they need to identify threats in that community. All right. Now, finally, I'll just summarize broader implications. We want something different now from people. So when I wrote Why People Obey the Law, the literature was very clear. We, what we want from the public is follow the rules. Nowadays, we don't think of it quite that way. We want the public to cooperate with law enforcement because we know that's a much more effective strategy. And that has been recognized throughout many different discussions in the social sciences. We need a cooperation between authorities and the public. We need to change the way we think about motivation because our goal has changed. We need to focus on creating social values like legitimacy. I've already talked about why we want that, because we, have, we benefit in terms of the behavior of the public. The problem with the instrumental approach, sanction approach, is it pulls people in the wrong direction. It undermines values, the crowding out effect, and it undermines the relationship between the people and the community, uh, the people and the police, because the police are associated with punishment. To me, we think of it as two alternative approaches. We could use sanctions, we can undermine values, then people break the law, we increase the sanctions to compensate for that, we build more prisons, put people in them longer, cooperation goes down, we need more police, or we could focus on values, we could get people to cooperate, get them to be invested in the system, to want to regulate their behavior, fewer prisons, fewer police, and more money to spend on things like education and social development. So what's the general point? The point is, to me, that we can use empirical research to point towards a different kind of relationship between legal authorities and the community. Instead of the police imposing themselves upon communities, focusing on if their actions are lawful and if they're effective, things that you can think about sitting in police headquarters and you don't even have to go out to think about those things, we should think about a more active engagement with the community. That requires us to think about what the community cares about, and what the community cares about is how the police exercise their authority. So I, I think, it's, to me, this is an example of how you could use social science to talk about different models of social control. And to me, you can identify a model of social control that is superior and hopefully provide a justification that people will find compelling
so that they'll accept it. Thank you. Well, as to the police, maybe I'll start with that. We have to start somewhere, and I think whenever we start, then increasingly, we will change the kind of people who become police officers. In the short run, I think it's encouraging that studies show that if the command staff changes the kind of behavior that they reward, then the behavior of officers on the street can change. I think it can change even more if we change the climate in the station house and change what the police officers want to do. So even existing police forces can change. But, right, the police, as we change the conception of policing, the kind of people who will become police officers will also change. I, I think that's probably true. And that, from my point of view, that would be good. Training can train everyone to some degree, but perhaps it'll become a different kind of job. I would use the example of the United Kingdom, where they really do seem to have a different model of policing, a much more professional model of policing. I know that they've had their difficulties, like the riots that they had, but still the level of cooperation between the public and the police in England is much higher, and the police seem to have a much more cooperative relationship with communities. So I think it's possible. I mean, it's, well, I think it's possible. I don't want to sound as if I don't see it as a challenge, but I think it's the kind of challenge we should be dealing with. Then as to sanctions, um, well, I think that what we want to do is we want to try to make sure that as much as possible we never get to the point of sanctions. That is, as much as possible people are cooperating, following rules, accepting decisions, because that's what they think is the right thing to do, and it never becomes an issue of sanctions. Yeah. Yes? Yes? Right. Well, I, I absolutely agree with you that I'm sure that's what the NYPD would say. And the problem, as with the aggressive street stop policy that they would say, you know, we got 9,000 guns off the street, is they never provide any real evidence. And in fact, they avoid any situation where there could be any real evidence gathered that would compare different policies. So you're kind of, I mean, it's, it's a difficult problem. What I would say is that here's a lot of evidence that a different approach would have worked better. 
but of course, ideally, what we would like to do is kind of a controlled experiment or something like that. And unfortunately, that particular police department has never seemed open to any such approach. So in that sense, I, I think I probably have to say there's nothing specific I can show you that would prove that that's true. I can show you all this other evidence. But I think that that's intentional in a sense. It's if you don't, like why won't the NYPD, why do they have to be in court for years to provide their street stop data? Their attitude is if we don't give anyone any information, then they can't question our policies. Right. But I do think that you're... You know, the question you're raising is a good general question for us because any time we try to change the status quo, we run into the same problem. There are people who are invested in the status quo, and the question is what can we do to change their minds? I think, and I guess I'm arguing as a general strategy, the one thing we can do is we can try to put together compelling empirical data that would potentially raise questions in people's minds. But I also would say that I think as a general comment about change, the people whose minds you change are not necessarily Ray Kelly. You know, that, in fact, and that's been my experience. I've gone to uh, several meetings uh, in Washington about anti-terror policy, and the people who listen are the people, the, the people who will become chiefs, the people who are younger. I think they're more open. They haven't decided what they think is right. And so if they can be convinced, then maybe you know, in the future things can change. Yes? Sure. Sure. Well, why don't I start out by just acknowledging everything you said. That is, there are no perfect studies. And 
so the question is, what's enough evidence? Certainly, even now, with all the evidence that I've talked about, I've been pushing very hard to get people to do randomized trials. And I think we'd be much happier when there's more of that kind of evidence available. I think from my point of view, when I started doing this as a, a psychologist, I was affected by the fact that there's hundreds of laboratory studies that show that procedural justice matters and affects behavior in laboratory. So the external validity question was the question that I was originally very concerned about, hence going and doing surveys and doing panel studies and so on, because those are real people in real situations with real police, and they seem, therefore, to be a way to complement all of the laboratory-based studies that are experiments and do have real behavior, but they're in a laboratory, often with college students. So I think that made sense at the time. As the literature has developed, we've tried, whenever possible, to get better measures like the, the Sherman study, where there's police records, or the Queen study, where they can do random assignment. I would be the first one to agree with you that we'd like to see more of that kind of evidence. And in fact, I, when I talk about this, what I imagine I'm doing is trying to encourage people to do that research. So. Well, let me put it this way, in line with the question about anti-terror policing. Do you think there's any good evidence to support what we're doing now? That is, it's nice to us. Okay, well, so, but I don't think you and I really disagree with each other on, on, in the sense that I would say that, of course, we need better research. And in a sense, I think I'm advocating doing more research about this I think it's good to think about policy implications of this research and to ask what kind of evidence supports the current policies. I think it's, it, we tend to assume, as with the anti-terror policing, that the people who are doing what they're doing have some good reason for this. I mean, for example, here I am at Stanford, so I can talk about the, uh, the, the um, Zimbardo experiments. Order maintenance policing is based upon that study Zimbardo did here at Stanford about leaving a car out on the street and discovering that people smash it up. So therefore, disorder leads to more serious disorder. So therefore, we should have aggressive street stop policing. We should have policing where we arrest people and put them in jail for minor lifestyle crimes like drinking beer, because if we don't, then we're going to encourage murder and robbery and so on. Well, that's an entire generation of criminal justice policies that's based upon one experiment. And if you look at that, you think, what? So I think we ought to also look at the evidence that's behind other policies as well. But I don't mean by saying that to be disagreeing with you. Better evidence is always a good idea. And sure, and if, if the argument that comes out of this is, and we need to go get that better evidence, then I'm all for that. If the argument is, let's not do anything, then I'm not for that. Because I think that there isn't a good reason for what we're doing now. Yeah. Thank you. 
Yes. Well, actually, I think what you're saying is a really good example to use as a broader example. I do research where I interview people. And I interview people like all of you. And what's amazing to me is people remember these experiences. The idea, right, right, but you're not unusual. I mean, everyone, and amazingly, even you sit down in a room full of police officials, and they'll say, I remember when somebody treated me that way. People remember being treated disrespectfully. They don't forget it. It has a big impact on them, and I think that's something that the police often forget, is that they are socializing people into a view about the law and a view about legal authority through the way they treat people, and people remember those things. Those experiences have a big impact on people's views, and they generalize, as you said, from those. The other thing I would say is your example also helps us to understand how the legality approach doesn't work. That is, like, how can the police in New York City stop 600,000 young people they did last year? How can they do that? Research suggests that in less than 1% of the time that they stopped those people, was there anything found? Guns, drugs, so 99% of those stops, the people were not doing anything illegal. They were walking down the street, they got stopped, they got searched, their backpack got dumped on the street. It's because the legality framework doesn't really help. Those people can't sue the police. They have nothing, they have no effective legal recourse. I got stopped by the police. You know, I, when I talked to the ACLU, they said, we won't even talk to somebody unless they were at least thrown in jail for a week. Then come to us and we'll talk to you about, you know, you want to try to do something. So the police basically have found a way to do what they want to do within the framework of lawfulness that has the consequences that you're describing. You weren't going to go, even if you had tried, you wouldn't have had much of, how, what could you do, right? I mean, essentially, well, that is why a lawfulness approach is not a good approach because people are affected by their encounters, even if those encounters are lawful, they're still upset. Anyway, yeah, yep, go ahead. Um, so I'm wondering about the culture of the and what you run into talking to the police about this. My impression is that uppermost in the minds of the police is their own safety and security, not getting yes. involved. Yes. In a dangerous situation like that. Right. Right. The primary thing is they don't want to be the victim of trouble. And I believe they've been taught and believe that a very dominant, harsh, tough approach is the best way to control the situation. They always want to be in control of that situation and have you pretty intimidated. And if that's police culture, really going against all that, I'm not saying you need to run experiments, but right. thank you for not yelling at me. <laughs> Yes. Well, so yes, I think the way you describe the situation is exactly correct. Both, well, let's just say that is the culture, that is what a lot of police officers think, and also that police officer safety is the number one issue that comes up when you talk about this. Fortunately, there's actually great research that shows that it's more dangerous for police officers to try to dominate the situation and assert force that if they do that, they're actually more likely to end up hurt. Now, of course, cultural change is more than evidence, right? But it's encouraging that there is actually evidence that shows that that strategy, which I completely agree with you is the strategy that most police think they should pursue, is actually, a, if the only goal is to s the safety of the officer, it's a counter strategy, it's not a good strategy. And that a procedural justice strategy actually is better from just the point of view of officer safety. So that's good. That's the evidence. Now, this larger question that we actually talked about, I've talked about before, is cultural change. I think it's, you know, it's hard to change culture. And so that's the tricky part, is to try to get the police to be willing to reconsider assumptions that they might have. Again, I think that I've seen a lot more willingness to accept them. Young, younger officers are more willing to listen and think about it. Older officers seem like it's harder for them to accept that because they've convinced themselves through their years that they know what's right. 
So we're focusing, like the, the COPS office is developing a training curriculum and they're focusing on entry level training academies. Can we train officers differently when they actually start to become police officers? So that's a hope. Yes. In order to measure procedural justice, we typically ask people the degree to which they think the police did these different things that we associate with procedural justice. Did the police give you a chance to explain your situation or state your point of view before they made decisions? Did they make their decisions based upon the law? Did they consider your, what you told them, your side of the story when they made their decisions? Were they concerned about your needs in the situation? Did they respect your rights? And then we correlate all of those judgments to things like whether people accepted the decision, whether they deferred. So being a psychologist, I don't believe that people know why they do things. That's a kind of common psychology view. So we never ask something like, why did you accept the decision? We ask all these things about the decision, like was it in your favor, was it fairly arrived at, and then we correlate those judgments to whether you accepted it. So that's what I mean when I show these numbers. Those people who said my rights were respected were also the people who said, and I accepted this decision. Okay, yeah. Well, I definitely think it's a concern. And so it's something I think we should always be very aware of. In the long run, I think that the right answer is that legality and legitimacy are considered as elements at the same time. And that we, right now, a typical police department will consider whether they're lowering the crime rate and whether they're breaking the law. And if they say, you know, we're not breaking the law and we're cutting the murder rate, great, we're wonderful. And I would just like to see them be, for example, having periodic community surveys. Are we legitimate in the community? But, but I agree with you that we wouldn't want to substitute perceived legitimacy for lawfulness, because then exactly what you said could potentially be um, something that happens. You know, it's funny, the police haven't quite picked up on this the way you've seen the possibilities, but in management, this is a big thing. It's like they have a book you can buy on how to act so that your employees think you care about fairness. I mean, basically, if, if you're a supervisor and you want, you, know, you want your employees to work hard, then they should think that you're trying to be fair. So what do you have to do to act like you actually care about fairness? Now, when you get to that point, then yes, there is a big risk. And I guess I can only say I wish we'd get to that point so we could be dealing with that problem as opposed to what I perceive to be the problem we're trying to deal with now. Okay. Yes. The way that we develop these models of procedural fairness is to go out and interview a lot of people and to look at, so for example, you're stopped by the police and I interview about all these different aspects of the situations. Which ones are related to your view about fairness or unfairness? <clears throat> and we usually find that people are very sophisticated. So they might have, say, eight different elements of the interaction that they would independently consider when they said they were or were not treated fairly. But four things seem to constantly come up. This idea of voice, 
that I had a chance to explain the situation before they decided what to do. The idea of neutrality, that I thought the police made their decision based upon rules or laws and not just their personal opinions or prejudices. The idea that they treated me with respect, so they were respectful of me, they were respectful of my rights as a person, courtesy, dignity, and then finally that I think that they were trying to do what was right for the people in the situation, that they cared about the needs and concerns of the people they were dealing with, which we often call trust. I trust that their motives were good motives. They were sincere. They weren't uh, trying to be prejudiced or be unfair in some way. They were trying to do what they thought was right in that situation. So those four come up. So we usually say those four things. But in the spirit of what you're saying, I think the point is it all comes from the people who we interview. I don't I did not sit down like a philosopher and write out a normative model of fairness, and I don't think the police have done that either. The Queensland study completely took those four elements from papers that I've written about. These are the four elements of procedural justice. What they did that I thought was really great is they thought about what can a police officer do standing out there on the road in 30 seconds that could reflect these different elements. Like, I, I really think it's brilliant, the idea of stopping at the end and, and thinking, now, what can I say that's nice? To, how can I respect this person with their dirty car, you know, and their, their bad attitude? What can I say? But my job is to come up with something to say, like, thank you very much for, you know, whatever, so that, that I am communicating respect for them. And that is a, an instantiation of an abstract idea. Yes? Well, so on the simple level, it's the same questions, absolutely the same issues. And in fact, the same issues work for officers as work for people on the street. We distinguish in the studies of police departments your supervisor, the sergeant or lieutenant that you see every morning who you deal with, and the larger structure of the department, the chief. And so if you imagine the NYPD with 20,000 officers, there's Ray Kelly up there somewhere, and then there's the person you deal with on every morning. And it turns out that both of those matter. So again, like with the idea that people are pretty sophisticated, officers distinguish, does my supervisor make decisions fairly? Does my supervisor treat me respectfully? Does the department make decisions fairly? Does the department treat officers respectfully? And all four of those elements have an independent effect on whether they say that their department is fair. But the one that really matters is respect from your superior. So if your sergeant treats you respectfully, that's the one that is the most important to people. No, no, that's, we're working on that. Actually, we're, I just have been involved in a study with the Las Vegas police where we're, we did that. We asked all those things, and we have uh, civilian complaints against the police. So we're trying to look to see if the, the police districts where the officers feel unfairly treated are connected to the level of civilian complaints. So next time, I hope I'll be able to say, oh, yes, we know. We know that's true. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, this study was done before they spent the 20 million and may not have had much impact on them if they went ahead and did it anyway, right? Yeah, I understand. Well, it's, it's a big problem. I, I have to say this, this technology thing that the law enforcement is into is a big... I was invited to give a talk to the military when they were in Iraq and they had all these problems where they, it occurred to them that they should think about why people hated them, right? And so they invited me to come to this meeting and I talked about all this. And, the other person they invited was a company that had developed this sonic ray gun.
where you basically aim it at a crowd and everyone's skin starts to crawl like they're on fire, so they have to leave. And so, you know, so technology, psychology, and the military loved that. They thought, great, you know, now we'll never have to listen to angry people anymore. We just aim our death ray at them and they're all gone. And that's the problem, right? The idea is that you think that a technological solution solves the problem. And I think it's a big struggle. I mean, I, it continues to be a struggle. If you go to a police convention, all the technology is all over the place. Again, I guess what I would say is I think we have to aim at the younger commanders, younger officers, and get them to change their view about policing at the beginning. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I do. I'll just give one example. There was a great study done in Chicago. A big problem in America is reentry, where people who've been put in prison for violent gun crimes are coming out of prison, and the recidivism rate is very high, committing new violent crimes and going back. So they developed a procedural justice approach. These are all violent offenders who committed gun crimes. They had a control group, they got the normal treatment, which is they sit, they actually sit down here and up here are the district attorneys and they say, you know, if you break the law, we'll catch you, we'll put you back in prison. And then they had the procedural justice group where people sat down at a round table with these offenders and said, we want to talk to you about our goal of trying to prevent people from going back to prison. Let's talk about your concerns. What can we do to make it possible for you to have a life where you don't commit another gun crime, you don't go back to prison? So they tried to use a procedural justice approach of treating people respectfully and equally and listening to their needs and concerns. They found that in the two years after that, there was a 40% reduction in recidivism. So the people in the procedural justice treatment, this is like one hour, were 40% less likely to commit another violent gun crime. So those are kind of hardcore criminals, and they were very affected by a fairly straightforward manipulation of procedural justice. Okay? And also, you know, drug courts and um, problem-solving courts are very similar in their design. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah, sure. Thank you.